sing tonight's song. Go to page 100. Lift me up above the shadows. Everybody stand. Otherwise, I'm going to be singing by myself. <laughs> Wednesday night prayer meeting, so if you have a prayer request or praise report, give that in at this time, then we'll gather around the altar for prayer. Any requests? Yes. All right, let's remember that request tonight. Any others? others. Yes. Well, I know 
from my dad. He's got severe COPD and he's just not doing well and I think <coughs> he's just giving up and just remember. All right, I'm some red. Remember Caleb in prayer. Yes. Yes. Uh, remember uh, Lloyd Locklear and his family, and keep the remembering me. Amen. All right. Remember those requests. Any others? Yes. I talked to Brenda a lot this afternoon, and she asked prayer for herself and her husband Paul. <coughs> Brenda used to come to church here a long time ago. Yes. And he has stage four cancer, and Brenda has some nervous damage. Oh, what do you call that? Service? Neuropathy. Right. So she needs prayer. And Jackie, I talked to her today, and her daughter, Cheryl, she's not, she's just be getting worse all the time. And Jackie said, please pray for Cheryl and her family. Yes. Amen. Remember that. Any others? Yes, Rob. Tom Woods, Bev Brantley's niece, anyway, her husband is seriously in the oh. hospital. All right, let's remember Sean. My goodness, Tammy, we used to teach her at Stuffner, didn't we, Miss Sean? Let's remember that request. Yes. Well, remember my twin brother, uh, Wednesday, he is going in for a total knee replacement. So All right. Just remember Saturday. All right, let's remember that request. Any others? Yes. Senior trip, yes, remember them. Anyone else? Yes. Uh, Trey, uh, we have a lady and uh, named Carol and a gentleman named Louis. And they told Carol today she's got cancer. And they told Louis he's got a spot on his liver. And my daughter Sandra, why, you know, she had double pneumonia. She's home, but the doctor told her now she's got a spot on each lung. And of course, they told her that she thought it told me real quick, you know. So just really, really pray for her. And just pray for my children that get back in the church. Amen. 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 Any others? All right, yes. Amen. Let's remember her in our prayers. Any others? Remember Bill's brother? Yes. I know this is sad. I can't hear. Um, just to remember the northern friends who are going back home and giving them safe travel and mercy. Amen. Amen. We'll really miss them. Amen. Yes. I'd like to thank everyone who participated in tonight's supper and prepared the food. Mm -hmm. It was a great time of fellowship and just kind of renewing to get around and see some folks before you get over here. We're looking for a good service. God for you two that have two boys that's minding the law. <laughs> Amen. Any others? All right, any unspoken requests, you'll raise your hand. All the will gather around the altar as we say.
all these requests tonight as we go to the Lord in prayer. Tonight's offering. It's good to have Greg Fallbush with us. Everything you give will go to support him. And so uh, remember that tonight. Brother Tom, would you pray for us? Dear Lord, we thank you again, dear Lord, for the privilege of being here. We thank you, dear God, for this church and what it stands for. We pray, dear God, that you will just bless each and every person that came tonight. We pray, dear God, for those that are sick, Lord. We know, dear God, that they need a touch from you. They need to be healed, Lord, it's thy will. If not, dear God, just put your loving arms around them. Pull them up close, Lord. Let them sense and feel the presence of the Holy Spirit with them, dear Lord. We pray that you'll bless the music tonight, dear God, and the singing. We pray that you'll bless the preaching tonight, dear God. Now bless this offering now, for we ask it in your precious holy name. Amen. Amen.
And we'll have Greg, ask Greg to come this time. Greg is now working at Welch College. He is the athletic director, basketball coach, a uh, little bit of recruiting. He was here for many years teaching at SCA and pastored at New Hope Free Will Baptist Church, but God called he and his family up there, and they're doing a great, great job. We're happy to have him tonight. Make him welcome as he comes to preach for us this evening. All right. It is good to be here tonight. I was uh, wondering and thinking on the way to church tonight, if y'all still did the sweet hour of prayer and the prayer time, and you did, and I'm thankful for that. And don't ever stop believing and doing things like that here. Uh, some of our churches, I'm in two or three different churches every month and preaching and uh, recruiting and raising money and doing different things. And in some of our churches, if somebody passed out or died, it would take about an hour for the paramedics to figure out who it was. So, uh, uh, so it is, uh, you know, it, don't ever stop doing that. And uh, it's refreshing to be in a church that still do, does that. As Will said, that we are up in Nashville now. When I left uh, uh, Sunday morning, it was 28 degrees. So everybody here is like bundling up, and I feel like going to the beach. All right, it's. <laughs> Uh, it's, um, you know, nice weather here. You don't know it, but it is. So, uh, But it has been an honor to uh, work at Welch and represent Welch and, uh, to be honest with you, just to represent our denomination. Uh, I preached here in July right before we went up, and, you know, I told you, hey, Charlie Bocha, he said he wasn't going to be in here. I need about four or five of those brick buy things <laughs> given to Charlie right here. So, um, But... You know, I, I, it's just an honor to represent Welch in our denomination and uh, to serve, serve the Lord in that capacity. Uh, God is doing some amazing things at Welch. We are, uh, our growth every semester uh, just keeps happening. We keep bringing new students. Uh, we're on a brand new campus, and uh, God is doing great things there. As he said, I'm working in the athletic department. Uh, I'm coaching men now. We coached uh, women here for years. And it has been, it was a little bit of adjustment at first. Uh, we started out one in ten. And if you watched my girls' teams play, uh, that was not something that was common. And uh, I about fired myself a couple times. And, uh, but uh, we, my players and I finally come to the conclusion that they was going to do it my way. And uh, we finished the season 16 and 16. And uh, so I had a good season. Uh, we have just announced a couple months ago that we will be having men and women's soccer next year at the college. And uh, if I can get some board members to help me, we'll have baseball pretty soon again and uh, different things like that. But we have cross country, golf, women's volleyball, men's basketball, women's basketball, and next year we'll have women's soccer and men's soccer. So uh, God is really doing uh, some amazing things. A lot of times I go through different reasons why that Welch is special, but I, since I'm here, uh, I want to tell you why Welch is special to me. Um, I, I can give you many different stories, but there is one that kind of hits home to me. In July, when my wife and I, we, we were convinced, or really May, that we were convinced we were moving and we moved up in July, right, the last couple months was pretty tough saying goodbye to here and goodbye to the church. But there was also something that was pretty tough, and it was my daughter. And she, uh, she was not going to go to Welch College. Uh, it wasn't, she was not going to go to a Christian college. Uh, she didn't want to have anything to do with it. We, uh, I told the kids in chapel this. We did not realize, I, you know, I pastored the church for years and worked at Christian school, and it was a shame of me. I did not realize how close we were to losing my daughter. And so you know why that I believe that Christian education is important. The latest study says that 52% of the young people that is saved and believe in God and serve in Christ, 52% of them when they go to a secular university and graduate do not believe in God. And my daughter was going to go to an art institute in Memphis and uh, we went and visited, and I told the kids at school yesterday that 
uh, when my daughter was there, she fell in love with it. And my wife was, and I were just, we thought we had raised a, just to be honest, a freak. I mean, it was like, how do you like this place? You know, nobody here has the right color hair. It was just, it was just unbelievable. And she, she was not going to go to Welch. So we just told her, well, you're not going there either. And we were moving to Nashville and she was going to go to a local uh, university in Nashville. And, and we were, you know, we weren't happy about it, but we were, well, at least she'll be at home and she can be in church with us. Three days before school started, she come to us and said, she said, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to Welch. I don't want to go, but I'm going to go. And we like, we don't care if you want to go. We're just glad you're going. Over the next couple of weeks, we started seeing a change in her. And what God has done in her life is absolutely amazing. Right now, if you see any pictures on anything that comes out from Welch College, she's taken those pictures. She works for the college. She's going to be traveling for the college this summer. She goes to different uh, institutions like prayer things. And it's just amazing the impact. And it's not Welch College. It's having her in the right environment. You know, I, I see Missy sitting there and I see her daughter at the school. And it's so awesome to see kids and environment. Now, we're, we don't, everybody's there don't have halos and everything, but they're in a right environment where we can teach and preach to them. And I, that is so special to me. And that's why that I believe Welch College is a special place. I believe that all Christian colleges and institutions are a special place. So that's, you know, kind of reason that I think it's special. Uh, I do have to make my spill. We have built a brand new campus 194 acres, I believe. Is that right? 194 acres, uh, 20 something million dollars. God is, has blessed us, and now we have to pay for it. And uh, one of the ways we're doing it is we're selling it brick by brick, okay? Um, a $250 brick that you can buy and, and have it in some put on it, and we're putting it down on a walkway. Uh, Will has already sold some here. Um, so uh, I've got to sell five, so I will preach until I sell all five. Um, you know, the quicker they go, the quicker I shut up. But uh, no, like, a lot of churches like to buy them in honor of former pastors. Uh, some's even said maybe buy them in honor of a former girl basketball coach you had at your school. Uh, I don't know, but, uh, but if you're interested in that, please see me afterwards. Uh, it goes to a good cause. So, but I'm here to preach tonight, so that's what I want to do. Uh, Psalms 55, if you have your Bibles. As I said, just turn to Psalms 55. I preached, uh, I've, I, I love the fact that I get to preach at different churches all the time because I've kind of entered the realm of the evangelist. And you might not know this, but most evangelists pick four or five sermons and preach them 52 times a year. I always loved when they went to my church and come to my church and preached, uh, they would they'd get done. Everybody's like, man, he did a good job. Well, he should have. He's preached that 43 weeks in a row, so he, he should have perfected that pretty good. Uh, so this is one of my messages that I've been, one of my three, met, and I'll preach a couple more than that, uh, that I go around preaching. I preached this message at a church here recently, and I, and I told the story about a church that got in a fight inside the church, and there was bitterness and anger got in there, and uh, the, the name of the church was uh, United, and, and they split and everything. And uh, Corey Mentor and another church said that the same story, uh, kind of the same story, different church. And I was wrong. The name of the church was not United. It was Unity. And I was preaching in that church. Uh, so, uh, uh, so I'm glad I'm familiar with the people I'm here tonight. Um, but one of the things that happens a lot of times in a church that hurts a church and hurts individuals is when we allow anger and bitterness and hatred to get involved in it. And to be honest with you, it just hinders the kingdom. It hinders what we're supposed to do. And uh, there's a, I've been preaching this message, and it's helped me, and it's helped others. And so uh, I'm, I'm going to give it to you tonight. And as soon as Charlie buys his five bricks, we'll be done. Um, so Psalms 55, verse 12. Um, that's where we'll begin reading there. In Psalms 55, verse 12. It says this. For it was not my enemy that reproached me, then I could have borne it. Neither was he that hated me, that did magnify himself against me. 
then I would have hid myself from him. But it is thou a man, it, but, it, but it is thou a man, my equal, my guild, my, my, my acquaintance. We took sweet counsel together and walked unto the Lord of the God of in company. Let death seize upon them and let them go down quick into hell for wickedness in their dwellings among them. Lord, we love you and we ask you, Father, that you be with us tonight. And Lord, you know my heart every time that I preach this message. And Lord, I, I want it to begin with me and go forward, Lord. And, and Lord, I believe that the churches need to get back to doing what they need to be doing and witnessing and leading others to Christ. And Lord, sometimes we hinder that in ourselves, and, and we mess things up ourselves. And Lord, we ask that you work among us tonight. In your holy name we pray. Amen. In Psalms 55 here, David is writing this passage. And in this passage, he says that somebody wronged me. But he said, I could have handled that if that was an enemy. But it was somebody that was close to me. It was somebody that hurt me that was close to me. In 2 Samuel 15, 12, we find out the man's name of who this was. His name was Ahithophel. And in 2 Samuel 15, 12, we were introduced to this man. He has been in the Bible before, but he has never been mentioned before 2 Samuel chapter 15. And in 2 Samuel 15, he is mentioned by name. And then in Psalms 55, they describe him. And he's not described in a very flattering way. He's described as a man that betrayed him. A man that, that tried to hurt him. And David here is writing about this man. He is not portrayed in a flattering light. We do not find anything about his kindness here. We do not find anything about his hard work. We do not find anything about his positive traits. We only learn of his hard heart. We only learn of him uh, what he did negative. In Psalms 55 verse 13, this is how David described him. And David described him as a man of his equal. Remember, this is David that the Bible describes as a man after his own heart. And he says that this man that did me wrong, this man that hurt me, was a man of my equal. He was my acquaintance, which means that he was his friend. He was a man that gave him wise counsel and godly advice. This was a man that one time had it all together. When David describes him, this was not a man, at, his life was always a wreck. This was a man that at one time had it all figured out and had everything in the right place. But in 2 Samuel 15, we find a man that is, has, has lost his way. We have found a man that has betrayed his friend. And we have found a man that has betrayed himself. For the Bible the readers that study this, you know what is taking place here in Psalms 55. You know that David's son Absalom is raising an army to destroy David. And there is a conversation that is going on here. And what has happened is Absalom and Ahithophel has tried to get together to hurt David. And this has hurt David, his soul. He cannot believe that the man that he loved was the one that set out to hurt him. I think it's worth mentioning here that Absalom is trying to kill the kingdom. And the setting this takes place is at night. And Absalom is, I mean, Ahithophel is sitting outside the city and it is dark. I will tell you that nothing good happens in secret. Nothing good happens in the dark. And here Absalom is trying to take his, his daddy's kingdom and Absalom and Heathfield meets and, and nothing good is coming from this. So when I look at Heathfield and throughout the scripture I see some things about him that I think is worth noting is this. First of all I see Heathfield's relationship with God. You say, Brother Greg, I, I don't understand what you're saying. How can he have a relationship with God? How can he be a man that tried to hurt David and you say that he had a relationship with God? Because the Bible gives testimony that he had a relationship with God. The Bible describes him as an individual that developed a relationship with God. We would refer to David, to, I mean, as Ahithophel today, as a saved man. He was a religious man. 
In 2 Samuel 15, he was a man that was given an offering. In 2 Samuel 16, 23, he spoke of the oracles of God, which means he taught, taught the scripture. He was a man that looked on the outside like he had everything going for him. He wore the suit to church on Sunday. From the outward appearance, everything looked good in his life. And let me add this tonight. It does not matter what it looks like. You have no idea what people are struggling in this building tonight. And some of them is going. Some of us in this building find ourselves in this place. And you would be surprised this morning tonight of who does not have it all together. Not only listen to this he he saved, but listen to this. And Second Samuel fifteen twelve says that he was a counselor. He was a man that gave advice. As a matter of fact, the Bible does not only say that he was given advice; says that he gave godly advice. This is a man at one time that had everything together. This was a man at one time that had everything going right in his life. And he looked like everything was there. But listen to this. He was, a, he was serving the man. Listen to this. Do you know who he was giving advice to and he was counseling? He was giving advice to the one that wrote much of the Psalms, to the songwriter of the Bible, the one that God says was a man after my own heart. And this man was the one that gave him godly advice. So I'm here to tell you tonight that it does not matter where you are in your relationship with him tonight. You better stay there. You better guard yourself. Because listen, tonight and tonight is not tomorrow. And we have to make sure that, that we guard ourselves. Ahithophel here, he is no fool. He was a man of great position and, and stature. Listen how David describes him in Psalms 41 9. It says, Yes, yea, a man, my own familiar friend, and whom I trusted, which I did eat of my bread and had lifted up his heel against me. Please keep that verse in mind. Let me read that again in Psalms 41, 9. It says, David says this, Yea, my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, which I did eat my bread, had lifted up his heel against me. You see here that he had a relationship with God, but also reality hit. Let me explain that. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, we see that there's a very sad verse or chapter in the Bible. In verse 3, David here sent and inquired after a woman. And this is where the trouble started. David is at his home and he's in the wrong place. He is supposed to be on the battlefield, but he's in the wrong place and he made a wrong decision. He should have never asked about this woman, but trouble starts happening here and some things started happening. If you look at the rest of the verse, that verse says that the woman he inquired about was the daughter of Elam. When you start connecting the dots, it says this right here. David sees Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam. 2 Samuel 23, 34 puts the puzzle together for us. It says Elam was the son of Ahithophel. So Bathsheba was, watch this, Ahithophel's granddaughter. Listen to this. Ahithophel was given godly advice to David, and David hurt Ahithophel by hurting his granddaughter. You see a man that is godly. You see a man that is serving and something happens to him in this situation and he's here and he has been wronged. Everything seems to be going great. And listen to this, things happen in his life. So you, you see here that reality hit. And we say, Brother Greg, how do you mean reality? Sometimes life is not fair. Sometimes things are going to happen. And that's what happens to a Heathfield. But not only do I see a one that's relationship with God and do I see one that reality hit, but I see a turn in his heart. Absalom calls for Heathfield and Heathfield was sitting outside by himself and he was just stewing about the situation and listen, this, nothing uh, could help and, and all of a sudden uh, he grows bitter and he becomes more bitter in the situation and in 1512 he goes out by himself and it's his wrong place. He's supposed to be in Jerusalem. He's in his hometown and things happen. He's, he's supposed to be with other people, but he is, he is not where he's supposed to be. He's supposed to be with people that's supposed to uplift him and help him, but he's out by himself. We are made for human interaction. He's hurting. He's supposed to be with people, but he's not there. Let me say this. If Satan can isolate you, he'll destroy you. 
He's alone. He's aggressive. When Absalom calls for him, he jumps at the chance to pay David back. Look at 2 Samuel 17.1. He feels, tells Absalom that he was willing to kill David. A man that was at one time David's best friend. A man that is one time that gave godly advice. A man that at one time served God is now got murder and hatred in his heart. He got to that point because he did not take the right steps. You never see anything that a man that gave godly advice, you never see anything about him praying. You never see anything about him taking the right steps. Bitterness is taking a man to a monster. A man that leaned on God that, to a man that could care less what God wanted in his life. And sometimes in our life we become bitter and, and we go through motions that nobody even know about. I preached this message in a small church um, up in Tennessee. You go to the end of the earth and you take a right and you're still not there. I agreed to do a three-night revival there, and um, I think I'm still there. I couldn't get out of there. And I preached this message uh, there on a, a Monday night. And there was a gentleman that was sitting about two rows back. And he just looked defeated. And as you can tell that I eat very well at my job. And after service that night, we had a meal, and, and uh, I didn't want to stay and eat. I'm lying. <laughs> and I go, and we're sitting, and we're eating, and, and that gentleman comes and sits down at me. Sits, sits, well, he actually stares right at me when he sits down. And, and, and Will can tell you this. You feel very uncomfortable in these situations because you don't know if you said something to make them mad. You don't know. And they're just kind of staring at you, looking at you. And he looked right at me. And all of a sudden, he started crying. And this man started sharing his heart. And he started telling me, and I don't want to go into everything that he had gone through, but this man had had a hard life from children passing away to his wife passing away to financials. It was a hard life, and he had become bitter in his life, and he had got to where that he had become just a shell of the man he used to be. I was back there again about two weeks ago, three, four weeks ago, I'm sorry, and I, and I preached there again and I almost preached this message. I, I've had to learn to start writing down where I preach and what messages I preach. And uh, I realized when I was there, I, I preached this. So um, I had to pull out another message and pray about it real quick. And, uh, uh, but I saw him sitting there, and they was for, listen, there was a complete change in his demeanor. He was smiling and he was happy and everything. And afterwards I asked the pastor, I said, what's going on in his life? He said, you, you will never believe it. He said, he said it took him for a while, but he said he spent a lot of time at the altar. He spent a lot of time in prayer. He spent a lot of time in God's word. But you know what eventually come back? He said his smile come back. And the pastor told me he had pastored the church for 52 years. Who is insane enough to pastor a church for 52 years? And he pastored a church, he pastored a church for 52 years. He said, I've pastored this man in the last 18 years. He has been bitter. And listen, it's not anything that I did. It's the fact that God got a hold of his heart and changed the man that was bitter and hatred in his heart. And God did something in his life. And let me say this, that is a much better way to live. But you notice here in this passage that we read and we're talking about here, and there he is, Heath the field, sitting outside and he's miserable. And Absalom comes along and he's miserable. Let me give you two East Tennessee sayings real quick. Birds of a feather will flock together. If you're miserable, I can guarantee you, you will find somebody else that is miserable. I pastored a church for a lot of times. Uh, for, uh, for, for a lot of years and I can tell you when somebody was uh, unhappy with me it did happen at times and then somebody else was unhappy they could not have talked for 20 years and they would find sitting beside each other at church within two weeks and they would just start feeding off each other. And that's what happened to Heath the Phil here. He rubbed into the wrong guy. He rubbed into another bitter person. And listen, birds of a feather flock together and nothing good for come for that. Give me, let me give you the second one right here. Don't be surprised when you get up with fleas when you lay down with dogs. 
If you hang around bitter people, guess what you're going to be? You're going to be bitter. You're going to look for things. And Ahithophel here, he does the exact opposite of things that he would have given David advice for. He would have gave David advice. Listen to this. Don't hang around people that's bitter. Listen, pray about this. Search God and do things like this. And Ahithophel is not doing this. He's sitting out here and all of a sudden he becomes aggressive and he comes with a plan and he comes with a plan and he wants to kill David. Look at what he does here. He he says this right here. He says, listen, if you'll give me 12,000 men, I'll kill him. He's he's hurting and he's suffering here. And he he becomes aggressive in his bitterness. And he looks at at Absalom and he says, you give me 12,000 men and I'll take care of this. If you studied the scripture, you know what happens. Absalom says... No. But let me explain this to you really quick. Let me tell you how far that bitterness will go. Hethophil was not even thinking clearly. If, if, uh, listen to this. If Absalom would have answered his request and gave him 12,000 men and he would have went to take over and took over the kingdom and killed David, he did not even think the extent of this. Do you remember when Jonathan, listen, when he was taken over and everything, do you remember what happened to his family? Everybody was killed but Mephibosheth. Do you know what would have happened to his granddaughter? His grandson? They would have been put to death as well. He got to the point where he was not even thinking clearly. And and when Absalom told him no, the Bible says here that he goes out, he gets everything in order, and he kills himself. 2 Samuel 23 says this, And when Ahithophel saw that his counsel was not followed. Now, I I found that very interesting uh, about a year ago when I found that, when I read that Ahithophel was a man that gave advice to David. He was a man that gave counsel to David. And all of a sudden, he's given advice to Absalom. And he's given the wrong advice. He says when Ahithophel saw that his counsel was not followed, he, he saddled his, I'm going to say donkey because I said the other word the other day and I had three little kids laugh for 20 minutes. So um, I'm not going to do that. And he arose and got him to his house, to his city, and put his household in order. And he hanged himself and died and was buried in a sepulchre of his father. Bitterness and hatred and, and, and unforgiven spirit in his life has taken him to that spot. I told you a minute ago to remember the verse in Psalms that we read. If you have your Bible, turn with me to the book of John chapter 13. The book of John chapter 13. For those of us in in the room that sometimes has an unforgiven spirit and, and hurts our churches and hurts the kingdom, turn to John chapter 13 verse 18. John chapter 13, verse 18. Jesus is talking here and he's preparing for his death. In John chapter 13, verse 18, this is what Jesus says. I speak not of all, not of you all. I know whom I have chosen. But the scripture may be fulfilled Do you know what it means when the scripture may be fulfilled? It means that it was somewhere before and now it's going to be fulfilled. And watch what it says. He that eateth bread with me lifted up his heel against me. The scripture talks about Jesus being betrayed. But if you read that and everything, does that not sound a lot about what David said? David here, he says, the one that I love risen, rose up against me and, and, and hurt me. And Jesus says the exact same thing. Someone that I love is going to hurt me. But here's the difference. Ahithophel goes out and he works on the bitterness and he grows and he destroys himself and he hurts his reputation. What does Jesus do? He dies for the one that betrays him. I told you that I I go to a lot of churches, but sometimes you don't have to go to church to see this. I have a young man on my basketball team. And he's a senior and he's graduating. this, This young man was a phenomenal basketball player. 
but he would not, he, you, you couldn't get a conversation out of him. When I would suspend him from basketball games, he would, okay. I'm like, can you at least put up a fight? I believe that he gave him advice to do. So my challenge to the church and everywhere I go is this right here. Come together. Understand the purpose of the church. It's not about the paint on the walls or the carpet. It's about the kingdom. It's about leading others to Christ. And along the way, because we're all fallen and we're all human, you're going to get hurt. People are going to do things. But in the scope, you still need to forgive, and you need to understand what your job is. Father, we love you. We thank you for your blessings. Lord, you're good. Lord, you show us your good. Lord, you are above us, and Lord, that gives us comfort. The fact you know us, Lord, it also should cause us to tremble because you know us. We ask that you work in our life. We give you the praise and honor for everything. In your holy name we pray. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, you're here tonight, you have a, a need in your life, a burden that you're carrying right now, you want to be remembered in prayer, would you just slip up your hand by that same, pray for me, bless those hands. As Greg spoke, I wonder if uh, maybe he was speaking to you, maybe there's something in your heart, some, some bitterness, uh, some unforgiveness, uh, maybe resentment, maybe it happened 30, 40 years ago and you've carried that. Uh, with you and uh, maybe you're here tonight and the Holy Spirit's dealing with you but you want to be remembered in prayer would you just be honest just slip your hand up and pray for me bless that hand and the others bless those hands bless those hands I'm mean, here tonight have loved ones who need Jesus you want to remember them in prayer just by lift of hand bless all the hands Lord we love you we thank you for the message to each and every one who raise their hand for different needs if any need to come for whatever reason God I pray that they would step out and heed your call we love you we thank you for it's in Jesus name amen let's stand together as we sing if you need to pray would you come 410 Jesus
give him a hand tonight. Thank you for coming. We do have a, a few announcements. Uh, if you're interested, uh, Greg, I'm going to ask you to go into the